Demand is back. Strongly back. Where is supply? We've, we've gone from an unprecedented shock of demand back in 2020 to what we see today, which is an unprecedented shock of supply. Why is it? Two things. People all along the value chain are struggling to get resources back. Yep. You know, people had, uh, suppliers had to adapt during the pandemic, lay out people, lay off people, and now they are struggling to get the competencies and the resources, human resources yep. back. Or the more so that you need to train people because they need to be qualified. Okay, that's Let's hope one. So. And the other one is tensions on raw materials, yep. uh, which has been exacerbated by the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. This has created a significant tensions on steel, titanium, aluminium, all key raw materials. So this is a combination of both that is creating this significant supply shock that we have never lived before. How long does it last? Probably all year long, and I would say even into next year. In the course of 2024. So to me, it will take us probably up to the second half of next year to recover. You want to build more resilient supply chains. How yes. does China fit into that geopolitical tension? You mentioned Ukraine. What about China? Well, we, we, we have to take into account the fact that the geopolitical tensions are rising. And therefore, we, we have to accept to pay the price of resiliency. We need to work on the resiliency of our supply chain, meaning not to be too dependent on one single country, avoiding single point of failure, and basically making sure that whatever happens, we have you know alternative paths. Let, let's talk about uh, one of your one of your major businesses, and that's the jet engine business. Uh, along with GE, you're, you're part of the CFN consortium. Um, you make the Leap engine, which sits below many of the world's narrow bodies. Um, a hugely successful product, but it's turning out to be a slightly more fragile product than many originally would have anticipated. Pratt, Pratt's having the same problem. Why are the latest generation of fuel-sipping, highly efficient jet engines proving to be less durable than maybe we originally anticipated? I would challenge that because if you remember 30 years ago, the CFN 56, in the early days, we had some durability issues yep. in severe environments. In severe environments such as in the Gulf or in India, Yep. The engines are suffering much more because the temperature is high, because it's dusty, it's sandy, and so it's, it's more difficult for the engines. So in the early days, we had some issues of durability issues on CFM56. We have fixed them, yep. and now, you know, the engines are running perfectly well. So in the leap, where we are today is basically where we were on the CFM56 30 years ago. Yep. the durability issue in those severe environments. So we will bring durability fixes in the course of this year and next year. So do you think, do you think the fact that you are maybe a little bit more advanced in those fixes means that you will be the engine? I, we've just seen a huge indigo order. Um, do you think, the smile, <laughs> uh, do you think we are going to see the Leap being the engine of choice in these more hostile environments? This is a fact today. Is it, is the, it going to become the, the, a bigger fact going forward? Uh, um, I guess I guess there's going to be a tender on the engine side for this new Indigo yep. order. But the fact is today that when you look at India, when you look at the Gulf, the Leap is the engine of choice. So in terms of durability, we yep. have an advantage over the... So you're talking to Indigo? Yeah, you're already talking to Indigo. We are going to talk to Indigo. And remi I, rem I remind you that back in 2019, Indigo had switched yep. from the other guy to us. The other guy. I love the way that works the in this guy. industry. Um, let's talk a little bit about... But we'll see what happens, you know. Uh, yep. Things are moving. But you I'm, think I'm, you will I'm, become I'm, the engine of choice in these regions? We are today. Yep. We are today. Um, As a matter of fact, we are today. Let's talk a little bit about... You're, you're considering buying Raytheon's um, aeronautics business, uh, um, uh, um, uh, cockpit. Uh, aviation business. I think I'm being imprecise about that. We <clears throat> we have communicated on that. Yep. There is a, a process which is ongoing, which is a competitive process. Yep. So if you allow me, I will not give you further okay. details on where we are. Okay. The, 
The only thing I would say is yeah. the rational, the strategic rational for us yeah. is to get into the flight control business. Yep. Flight control is uh, mission critical. Yep. And so it fits with our DNA because our DNA is to be in businesses where the values of entry are high yep. and the aftermarket solid. The, the, the words flight control seem to go out of my head at that point, so thank you for reminding me of it. The, the reason I ask is this, and you don't have to give me details as to whether or not you've got to proceed with this. You've already indicated that it would fit well with the business. There is an argument that says that it is either share buybacks or it's buying Raytheon's flight control business. Could you theoretically do both? Of course, we, would. we could do both. It's not one or the other. The fact is we have a strong balance sheet today. We, are, we have no debt. Yeah. We are net cash positive. Yeah. And we are going to generate a very strong cash flow in the years to come. And we have already communicated to the market on that. So we can do both. I mean, we have a policy of nice return to shareholders yep. because we believe it is important that our shareholders are happy and we it's want to idea. make them happy. Yep. Uh, and at the same time, we, I mean, we may consider opportunistic mergers and acquisitions. 